This program continues the aspect of geology that we began looking at last week, the economic end of the business, so to speak. We'll look at two of Canada's most important geological resources, the Athabasca tar sands and the Sudbury nickel ores. It also brings us to the 22nd and the last program in the series, and I hope that as well as informing you, we've managed to arouse your curiosity sufficiently for you to continue thinking and doing some geology of your own. Um, I hope that perhaps one day I'll meet some of you on outcrops. One more hour of geology. material prosperity of a country is very much controlled by its geology. If it has greenstone belts and ancient subduction zones, then it's likely to be very well endowed with metallic ore deposits. And if on top of that it has relatively thick, undisturbed sequences of sedimentary rocks deposited in deltas and in the shallow seas of continental shelves, then it's likely to have oil and coal as well. Such a country is Canada, probably the most fortunately endowed country in the world. And that's what these two specimens have in common. This ore from Sudbury, by most standards, the most productive mineral area in the world, and this tar sand from Athabasca, the largest liquid deposit of hydrocarbons in the world. We'll look at the geology of these two great deposits, beginning with the Athabasca tar sand. The prairie provinces already supply most of Canada's fossil fuel, and the 350-mile arc of tar sand in northeast Alberta is still a largely untapped resource for the future. The well-known Athabasca part of the tar sand occupies about 9,000 square miles between 55 and 58 degrees north and is cut by the Athabasca River. The center of current development is 275 miles north of Edmonton and 23 miles from the nearest town, Fort McMurray, at the junction of the Clearwater and Athabasca rivers. To the north is the Wood Buffalo National Park. A barrel of oil contains 35 Canadian gallons. The tar sand deposit as a whole is estimated to contain about 800 billion barrels of raw bitumen. The Athabasca part of the deposit contains some 626 billion barrels, which, when refined, would yield about 430 billion barrels of crude oil, which would equal about two-thirds of the world's known crude oil resources. However, current technology can only recover and refine something over half of that, which is still one million barrels of oil a day for 750 years. The tar sand is buried by up to 2,500 feet of overburden. Black spruce and tamarack swamp grow on about 20 feet of muskeg. Beneath that is a variable thickness of glacial gravel and Cretaceous shale and sandstone. Although removing the overburden and developing the technology for recovering the bitumen will be extremely costly, the usual expense of exploration is not a problem because the Athabasca River has about 120 miles of tar sand exposed in its banks. Outcrops of the bitumen-bearing Cretaceous sand are black and sticky, and in the warmth of summer, the bitumen oozes from cracks and bedding planes, laying down a slippery film at the water's edge. After Indians had for many years mixed the bitumen with spruce gum and patched their canoes with it, white men discovered the deposit. It's about 140 feet thick on average and varies between a minimum of 90 and a maximum of 
220 feet. The deposits were first discovered in 1778 by fur traders. And there are still the scars of the excavations, the test excavations, which have been made since then. The black bitumen was quite a curiosity to many of the early explorers of the Athabasca River. One of those was a fur trader in the 18th century, in 1778, one of the most best known explorers of the Athabasca River, Peter Pond. Since him, the list of discoverers and surveyors reads like a historical who's who. Alexander Mackenzie was the first to recognize the black bitumen for what it was, and by 1888, the geological surveys R.G. McConnell had thoroughly investigated the deposit and determined that it had commercial possibilities, but not for oil, instead for paving roads. And Dr. Adolf Clark developed his hot water and steam method for separating the oil and sand in the early 1920s. And today, the bush around the Athabasca tar sand is the graveyard for dozens of experimental and commercial sites. Geologically, the tar sand is a poorly consolidated sandstone deposited by a Cretaceous river which drained over and eroded into the Devonian limestone in the area about 120 million years ago. In other words, the tar sand lies on an unconformity. The limestone is clearly visible in the lower part of the banks of the river, and the unconformity is clearly marked. It's a well-bedded limestone deposited during late Devonian time, 350 million years ago, when Western Canada was covered by a warm, shallow sea, rich in marine life, such as reforming corals. The bitumen of the tar sands may have originated in those limestones and later seeped upward into the sandstone, which thus acted as a reservoir for the bitumen. The limestones are about 350 million years old and the sandstones about 120 million. So the unconformity represents a gap of perhaps 230 million years in the geological record. Above the economic tar sands is barren Cretaceous sand and shale, covered in turn by the sand and gravel left by the glacial ice which melted away from here about 15,000 years ago. The present mining technique is open pit, which clearly exposes sections of the overburden. The glacial debris is yellow, overlying the gray Cretaceous shale. At present, it's uneconomical to dig deeper than 150 feet to extract the tar sand. This accounts for the wide difference between the potential recoverable quantity and the current recoverable quantity, which is only about 10%. The first step in the excavation is clearing the Tamarack Swamp and the underlying 25 to 20 feet of muskeg. Water must be drained off in ditches which are dynamited. Water is then left to run off for about two years. Clearing the muskeg can only be accomplished in winter when the ground is frozen. Otherwise, the 150-ton trucks that haul the muskeg away sink into the ground. Once the muskeg has gone, the glacial boulders and the sand and the gravel and the Cretaceous shale can in turn be stripped off. In the Great Canadian Oil Sand Company's operation, this overburden is then put to use in building 300-foot retaining dikes to hold the tailings from the extraction plant. Over the next 10 years, 21 150-ton trucks will move about 13 million cubic yards of overburden per year. With the overburden gone to the dikes, the oil sands are exposed. The Great Canadian Oil Sand Company has two massive self-propelled bucket wheels that scoop the black sand to a conveyor system. The bucket wheel itself is 33 feet in diameter and the machine stands about 10 stories high. It's electrically powered and weighs 1,800 tons, about the same as a 